Go for it, Connor. All right, thank you. Um, so my topic is about optimizing the production rate of mixotrophic algae with nutrient remediation. Um, I was planning on starting a lot of my research this summer, but unsurprisingly because of COVID, a lot of that's been put on hold. Um, so instead, I'm gonna be talking more about some of the background behind my research and sort of the approach I wanna to take to my experiments. Um, so to get started, um, the reason I'm working with phytoplankton is because they can produce a wide variety of compounds that are valuable to humans. Um, these can range from aquaculture feeds to various health supplements and even people looking into biofuels. Um, for me though, I'm looking more onto omega-3 fatty acids, specifically eicosapentaenoic acid, as well as carotenoids and protein and biomass, which can be used for aquaculture feeds. Uh, a major problem that comes up when trying to do mass culturing of algae is the high cost either associated with growing the algae itself or with actually harvesting it. So there's sort of a desire and a need for new techniques to be de developed in order to help either improve the productivity or decrease the cost involved with culturing algae. And that's sort of what I want to look into a bit more. Uh, so the first way is changing the way we actually grow the algae. Uh, the most common method is using phototrophy, um, where the growth is sort of fueled using light as an energy source. Um, and the other big one um, is heterotrophy, which is using organic molecules. But phototrophy by and large is used more, more often, partly because you can just use the sun for it. Um, but mixotrophy has a potential option to increase the growth rates compared to either phototrophic or heterotrophic growth. Um, and it's the case in which the algae are using both phototrophy and heterotrophy at the same time. Um, and in, when they do grow like that, typically you have much higher growth rates than either phototrophic or heterotrophic growth can achieve on their own. Uh, the other option we have is using nutrient remediation. Um, so because there's this wastewater is produced that can be very rich in nutrients, when they reach the environment, they can cause hypoxia or harmful algal blooms. But because these waste streams are also high and so high in nutrients, and in some cases also organic carbon, they could be used as sort of um, as a supply of these nutrients and carbon for our cultures of phytoplankton, um, which would help supplement the cost of our having to supply the nutrients ourselves because the waste streams are typically either low cost or effectively free because nobody really wants the waste. Um, but using these as an option for um, reducing the cost of our algal production would also have the side effect of helping to reduce eutrophication. So it kind of gives us a two birds with one stone effect. Um, so I, I want to look at optimizing the production of target molecules using mixotrophic growth. Um, I'm working off funding from the Weston Foundation with matching funds from Nature's Way of Canada and RSC, as well as some funding from NSERC. And I've sort of broken down my work into sort of three main objectives. Uh, the first one is I'm looking at screening target species of phytoplankton under both phototrophic and mixotrophic conditions at different temperatures and irradiances. Uh, from there, I'm gonna look at species that have a high production of either protein, EPA, or carotenoids. And then once I identify these species, I'd like to try to find what optimal conditions would both most optimally produce those target molecules in the best amounts. Um, so as I said with the target species, I largely want to look at my local species or those already widely used in aquaculture. Because although we can be very careful, there is always a risk that anything I work with could escape into the environment. Um, in which case it'd be a lot better if it's a local species as opposed to something invasive. I will be getting my strains from the NRC. Um, and previously in our lab, we've done some work with distillery, um, with waste products and nutrient remediation. So we've worked with Thalassiosyra pseudonana and Tetrasoma swissica, which showed an increase in their growth rates and yields when grown with distillery tails, which is a waste product produced from distilleries. As well, uh, T. pseudonana was also been tested with uh, whey permeate, which is a byproduct from cheese making, and it also showed an increase in growth rates and yields. And finally, I'm gonna, I already know I'm gonna look at Pengueococcus pyreneodosis and Phaeodactum tricornutum, because both of those are, um, the literature says, have very high content of EPA. So they're a good target species for um, those, those fatty acids. So as I said previously in the lab, some people have worked on nutrient remediation with Tetrasoma swissica. Um, here in the first three graphs, so A, B, and C, are showing the particulate carbon, the particulate nitrogen, and the particulate phosphorus. And comparing the control medium, which is our standard medium we use for growing a lot of our algae, compared to one that's been amended with uh, the distillate, um, which is from the distilleries. The orange bar shows what the normal amount of carbon, phosphorus, or nitrogen would be available to the cultures based on the normal medium we use. And what's very clearly seen is that the cultures typically cannot use all the carbon available to them, which means there's some amount of a nutrient that's limiting their growth. But when we do add it about a 0.5% of the culture being distillate, we actually find a huge increase in the carbon, nearly doubling it. And there's even higher increases in the particulate phosphorus and the particulate nitrogen. 
Um, what this means is essentially because we're adding this on top of the medium we already use, and because it's a waste product that's effectively free, um, we are essentially getting a huge amount of increase in biomass and nutrients in within our cells without actually having to cost us anything. So this is an example of being able to increase the productivity of our cultures. And finally, looking at uh, D, we can see the phosphorus, either the particulate phosphorus in green, which is the phosphorus within our algae, compared to the blue, which is the residual phosphorus in the medium. Um, and this demonstrates the comparison between how much phosphorus is actually added to the culture and how much it was able to be remediated, which considering how much phosphorus was added with the small amount of distillate, um, it shows that the algae are very, very efficient at um, remediating the distillate. So uh, taking all that, what I'm gonna be doing is looking at the production rate of target molecules. And to look at this, I'm gonna be using the production rate equation um, shown here. Um, it takes into account the biomass, the specific growth rate and the biomass quota, which is going to be like the proportion of the biomass made up of my target molecule. And taking all that, I can use it as a metric to help evaluate um, my production rate between different organisms and looking at my cultures under different conditions, which typically can get a bit challenging when you're looking at different species of phytoplankton. But this will give us a way that we can sort of more objectively look between different species and see which ones are performing best for which target molecules. Uh, to sort of show a demonstration of this, I've looked at some data from Muhammad et al. 2014. Uh, they were looking at tetracellus cultures and growing them phototrophically, mixotrophically, and heterotrophically. Um, and they're, they're glucose, they use glucose for the heterotrophic and mixotrophic growth in addition to it. Um, so looking at this, um, the first graph shows the biomass and how it changes over time. Uh, the blue showing the mixotrophy, the orange showing the heterotrophy, and the green line showing the phototrophy. One important note is that they were growing their phototrophic cultures at very low light, so there was expected to have low growth rates, which was what was observed. But the important thing to take away from this is that across the board, the biomass, uh, the growth rate, and then the biomass change over time, um, almost all the, throughout most of the experiment was higher when grown mixotrophically, which shows this, again, as I said earlier, this better performance and better growth rates, higher biomass that occurs when you grow the cultures mixotrophically, which is um, shown in a lot of different literature, which is why I want to grow my cultures and focus on that mixotrophic growth. Uh, the other thing they looked at was how mixotrophy changed the lipid quota within our, the cells they were growing. So to do this, they grow the cultures up um, with about 20 grams per liter of glucose and compared the mixotrophic and heterotrophic cultures. Uh, they sampled at the early exponential phase, the late exponential phase, and the early stationary phase. And as the time went on, they found that the lipid quota became higher with it hitting a, its highest point was in the early stationary phase. But throughout the entire experiment, they also found that mixotrophy was, had a much better uh, lipid quota and much higher than compared to the early stationary phase. Uh, so from this, it kind of indicates that the best time to harvest for lipids would be the early stationary phase. But when we actually look at this using the production rate equation, which is the final fit graph here, um, it shows that the late exponential phase far outperforms the early st stationary phase when compared um, with the production rate equation. And the major reason for this is that in the early stationary phase, you're reaching sort of the carrying capacity of the culture. So the growth rate is rapidly dropping and there's not a lot of new production of biomass. Whereas in the exponential phase, you have that much higher growth rate, which in this case, although there is a higher quota in the early stationary phase, it doesn't, is not able to overcome the fact that there's such a low growth rate. So overall, it shows that the best time to harvest or the continuously harvest would be the late exponential phase. Uh, Muhammad et al, they also looked at how mixotrophy changed um, when you increase the dose of glucose. So overall, they found it, the growth rate was dose dependent, where as they increased the rate of glucose, they got higher and higher growth rates and higher biomasses were achieved. But this leads to a certain point at which the culture becomes oversaturated. And this is shown with the, red, uh, the figure on the right here, with the red line being 40 grams per liter, um, which actually begins to show a decline compared to 20 and 30 grams per liter of glucose. And as they showed before with the other figures, um, mixotrophic growth will can change a chain, cause a change in the cell quotas. Um, in this case, uh, for the Muhammad data, it was in the change of the lipid quotas. But there's also been other literature that suggests that mixotrophic cells have lower pigment quotas. And this is very important for me because it means we could have higher biomass concentrations in our cultures. Uh, the reason for this is because the amount of biomass in a photobioreactor, which is how we can grow um, a lot of, one way to grow cultures on a large scale, um, the, the amount of biomass you can have in one is limited by the optical density of the culture. So if the cells have a lower pigment quota, they're going to have a lower optical density, and that means we can maintain a higher biomass within our culture, which again means we have higher productivity. 
So taking all of that, it sort of informs me in how I want to look for what I'm looking for in an optimal strain. Um, ideally, it would be increasing all of the terms, but in, I would also be settling for if it only increases some of the terms of the production rate equation. Um, but this could occur through the, an increase in the standing stock, as I was just saying, because of a down regulation of those pigments. Or we could have an increase in the growth rate or cell quotas because of the mixotrophic growth. The way I'm going to be approaching all of this, I've kind of taken, uh, broken my experiments into two main sections. Uh, the first one would be a screening process, looking at different species um, under different conditions to determine which ones uh, would likely increase the production rate equation factors. Um, so the first part of that is going to be batch cultures. So just growing the cultures up to stationary phase and characterizing their biomass and growth rate. Uh, so I can compare the phototrophic versus uh, mixotrophic growth. And then I'm going to be growing my cultures in semi-continuous growth, um, so maintaining them in, a, in the exponential phase. And I'm going to be harvesting from that to look at the lipids, proteins, and pigments um, with help from the NRC. And from all of that, I should be able to have a good estimation of how each culture performs with relative to the production rate equation and figure out which cultures have the best production rates. And once I've identified those cultures, I will lead into my second part of my work, which will be looking at trying to better optimize the production rate based on different temperatures or radiances or the, the amount of sort of um, nutrients I'm adding in through my waste streams that we're using for nutrient remediation. Uh, so are there any questions? Any questions out there? Eating them yeah. all mission. Oh, we got one. John Cullen. Great. Go ahead. So oh, that, that's real nice. Thanks for giving us the presentation. Uh, right on your last slide about your approach. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that looks great. But uh, if you're doing remediation and, and you are building upon the history of uh, research in your lab, you'd add uh, one thing that you may not have mentioned, and that's with the semi continuous cultures. Uh, to grow them to some point and then uh, stop the addition of whatever your amendments are. And that's good for nutrient remediation because uh, over the next couple of days, the cultures will clean up everything that's in there, but they also might accumulate the things you like. Do you have any thoughts on what you're gonna do with those semi-continuous cultures uh, when looking at the way to get best yields uh, to do what's essentially a two-stage uh, uh, production cycle where you uh, uh, grow them in the conditions that you're studying really well and then cut off the uh, the inputs and see what happens. Uh, that is a consideration I've had and I know I've discussed it with Hugh because as yeah as we said um, in order to really re fully remediate the nutrients you need to sort of take them all the way to the end and at some point stop adding them in so they can get used up. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be going into too much detail into that just because I think there's going to be some time constraints with my research and trying to get everything done and finish my master's. Um, it's something that's- it's worked twice as hard, it's okay. Yeah, I know as it is when I was talking with my committee, we were talking about how we were trying to figure out what I'd have to cut or not be able to do just because it can be a lot of, it can be very time consuming to characterize this much information for the algae growth. Well, good luck with all that, but uh, you just turn off that culture and watch it for two more days, you're gonna learn one heck of a lot. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, John. Any other questions out there for Connor? Going once, going twice. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for your talk. It was very interesting. Thanks, Cheng Fei, as well.